So this is an update to our sense making series, which started about a month ago with what the f is going on. And in that film, I talked about the crisis in journalism, especially the crisis in American journalism, American media. And so much has happened even in the last few weeks and few days that I think it's worth doing an update. And I think why this is so significant is that it's a crisis within American journalism, but by extension, it's a crisis within truth seeking, within sense making. And this has huge consequences for everyone in the rest of the world. I think one of the things that maybe one of the unexpected consequences of the big tech platforms kind of domination, the fact that almost all of us get most of our media through the tech platforms, is that it's kind of globalized the American culture war to the rest of the world. So we're all influenced by it, whether or not we want to be. And just on that, there's another film coming up in the next couple of days with Tristan Harris, who's been described as the conscience of Silicon Valley who's made it his mission to look at how the big tech platforms are boosting polarization, boosting division, and what we might be able to do about it. To get attention within that, that sphere, I have to use outrage. So both sides, the left and the right, are using outrage to get, people to, get, to get people's attention, and then that just further cleaves the kind of divide. So just in the last few days, there have been a few really major events in American media. Barry Weiss, the opinion editor at the New York Times, who wrote the original intellectual dark web piece, and has been a sort of champion of heterodox opinion within the New York Times has left with a really kind of biting and quite detailed resignation letter. And also Andrew Sullivan, who was one of the few conservative columnists at the New York magazine, has also left. So I think the overall frame for Barry Weiss and the New York Times, which is something she talks about in her letter, is that the election of Trump in 2016 should have been a time for people on the more liberal side to stop and think about why people were voting for Trump, what it was about kind of the way that liberalism was showing up and the increased kind of intolerance with other views that was making people or pushing people towards Trump. And actually the opposite seems to have happened. So she says in her resignation letter, the lessons that ought to have followed the election, lessons about the importance of understanding other Americans, the necessity of resisting tribalism, the centrality of the free exchange of ideas to a democratic society have not been learned. Instead, a new consensus has emerged in the press, but perhaps especially at this paper, that truth isn't a process of collective discovery, but an orthodoxy already known to an enlightened few whose job is to inform everyone else. But the main thing I wanted to talk about was the Harper's letter. So it was a letter that was originally conceived of by Thomas Chatterton Williams, who we had on recently on this channel. And it brought together, the attempt was to draw a line in the sand. So three paragraphs of fairly mild defenses of free speech and calling out the attacks on free speech on both the right and the left that was then signed by a host of people from academia, from the literary world, including people like Salman Rushdie, Margaret Atwood, Noam Chomsky, Malcolm Gladwell, and JK Rowling but it caused a huge backlash. So to unpack all of this, I thought the best person to speak to would be Jesse Single, who we interviewed recently for the Death of Journalism piece. So Jesse's a freelance journalist who's written for a lot of these institutions and also has recently set up the Blocked and Reported podcast with Katie Herzog. So it kind of gives him a front side view of everything that's going on, but also gives him a certain sense of freedom and detachment from it now that allows him to really speak his mind. We recorded only like three weeks ago uh, with a piece that I put out called The Death of Journalism, which I thought might be a little bit kind of clickbaity, but it doesn't appear to be. And like this kind of dumpster fire or I think what you called an epistemic break in journalism sort of has continued to ramp up over the last kind of couple of weeks since we spoke last. I'd like to start by by that frame, like you said an epistemic break and that felt really right to me. Like there's something in the norms and the way that things have happened over the last few weeks that seems to, to su suggest that something's really shifted. So maybe we'll talk about that first and then talk about what some of the actual events are for people who maybe aren't on Twitter as much as we are. Sure. And, and I think I did this last time, but I'd like to first apologize for my haggard Jewish caveman look. This is a... Uh, an experiment during the pandemic. I'm usually a little bit more put together than this, but um, yeah, I mean, it's important to talk about this stuff in a clear way. I think journalism still 
the majority or the vast majority of people in journalism are in journalism because they're interested in the truth and they're not just in it out of politics. They, they might have politics like mine that are broadly progressive and they don't hide that, but that's, that's different from seeing Paul, um, journalism specifically as like a tool for advancing very narrow political claims. And what we're basically seeing is like less and less of a sense that journalism is separate from activism. Journalism is just sort of employed as a tool for activism. And um, as I wrote about in my, in my newsletter, there's just been sort of a, a series of alarm bells in recent years about this. One of them was, was the big Covington case where a short video seemed to indicate uh, that a group of, of, mostly white uh, kids from a Catholic school were harassing a Native American activist. I, I watched as professional journalists, even when a longer video was revealed, that that really made it seem much more complicated than that and much more like the activists sort of walked into the circle of kids who are already chanting and cheering than that they had harassed him in any way. Um, the worst thing you could say about some of these kids was that they did the tomahawk chop, which is considered offensive by some Native Americans, but is also something tens of thousands of American sports fans do every day. Um, if any of your viewers are confused by that, you can just Google it and get an explanation. So I, I watched in online and offline discussions, I watched journalists refuse to see what was before their own eyes. Like the video, certain aspects of this were made very clear by the video, but it seemed like the sort of incentives to come out against the Covington kids, because we need it either before or against everything and there can never be any complexity, were, were so overwhelming that people just sort of let their own values and social incentives override what was on a video in front of them. And it, it was very much, people of course overuse Orwell in these situations, but that whole like, how many blinking lights are in front of you, not being able to say what the answer is, disturbed the hell out of me. And Covington was not the most important story by a long shot, but but it just pointed to these trajectories in journalism that just worry the hell out of me and, and that are, are bad. So that's the, the long-winded, under-caffeinated answer. Yeah, it's like that. Um, is it the, It's the Ash conformity experiment, isn't it, where you have the sort of three people give a wrong answer and all of them are in on it and it's the one person who goes along or doesn't go along even though what they're seeing in front of their eyes is is not um is not true well not only that but i mean the the ash conformity experiment which i think some of the results have been overplayed over the years because a lot of people did not go with the crowd i forget the exact number either way um there's a guy dan kahan at yale who i always reference uh, just a brilliant uh he's trained as a legal scholar i think but does a lot of psychology and he has this idea that our our views on these issues are really determined by our social networks and and our religious and political networks and the Ash Conformity Experiment showed that even in a situation where there's no moral or political valence, where the only thing at stake was, you know, going against a group of strangers, a fair number of people would give an objectively wrong answer to not go against the crowd. You add to that the sense that you're doing something morally or politically wrong or that you're um, sort of going against the group or betraying the group and, and people just go crazy. And then you add the, the social media landscape, which is brutal, where you get instant feedback with every opinion you express. And it's just, it's adding up to something really ugly that this is not the cause of journalism's problems. The cause of journalism problems are wide ranging and structural and journalism is totally screwed. But journalism is is in the process of, of furthering its own screwing or accelerating it by, by just adopting these really bad standards that the average person understands and can see what's going on and that it's increasingly not about truth or journalism. Uh, so, so let's just recap sort of some of the things that have happened recently. There was the the Harper's letter, which was quite a kind of anodyne, fairly vanilla letter, which was three paragraphs of sort of talking about the value of free expression and made pains to criticize both sides. It talked about the right as well as the left, but talked about a censoriousness on the left that was signed by a huge number of kind of the great and good of writers. And, and some mediocre was, ones too. And some mediocre ones too. The great ones like yourself and Katie and then some people no one's ever heard of like... Sam and Rushdie, Atwood. some asshole. Yeah, Sam and Rushdie, those kind of people. But then it just caused this incredible shit show online, even while the letter was, was fairly kind of mild in what it, was, what it was kind of trying to assert. Mainstream outlets immediately just misrepresented the letter and, and 
basically crept right up to the line of lying about what's in it. Because if you're responding to a letter by saying this person saying X when they didn't say X, that's pretty close to a lie or a bad faith reading. And, and tried to impugn the motives of the people in the letter who signed the letter without pointing to any evidence they believed, what you claim they believed, just all these sort of bad faith and, and censorious maneuvers. That's the sort of environment we're in right now, and it's not fun. And, and I think what pissed me off the most of all was people saying there was a counter letter that said that, look at these powerful people who signed the letter. They're afraid they're going to get canceled. No, I'm I'm at this point not afraid I'm going to get canceled. Of course, I'm worried crazy people will occupy gatekeeping roles in journalism and make it harder for me to write for the Times or whatever. But at the moment, one of the reasons I felt safe signing the letter is I'm I'm not easily canceled at the moment. Like I have independent income. I have a book deal. I'm very fortunate. And I want it to be the case that other people can be as free as I am to express my opinions without fear of some asshole trying to get me fired. And that annoyed the hell out of me because like, nobody actually thinks Steven Pinker is afraid he's about to get fired or Noam Chomsky. It's just, it's so remarkably bad faith to say, oh yeah, oh, Noam Chomsky is afraid he's going to get fired. And I just, you know, as I say this out loud, there are journalists working in war zones. There are journalists trying to reveal what the Chinese government is doing to an ethnic minority, which might be tantamount to genocide. And, and I don't think it's a good look for us New York and Brooklyn media types, to just the amount of energy spent on these bullshit claims of, of harassment that are not, you know, I feel bad for Barry. I feel bad for the Vox staffer. Journalists go through some serious shit that is not people on Twitter yelling at you or even making death threats at you. Like Twitter's crazy. I, I, just the amount of focus spent on these sort of intra-left journalism issues, um, it does not benefit us in the long run, even if in the moment they feel important. And they are important in a way. It's just like the the sheer amount of energy and time we spend on this stuff is not good. And I'm including myself in this. Yeah, I, I agree. I think going into the kind of minutiae of it is very inside baseball and seems very sort of self-indulgent, which is why I thought that the main piece was the epistemic break. Like, what does it mean if you're an organization that's, that is supposedly aligned around truth, but actually you're seeing an increasing lack of truth in sort of what's being reported. That's why I think the epistemic break piece is such a vital point to come back to when you're actually talking about a situation and people are misrepresenting or ignoring the facts of that situation. Like that seems to be a really fundamental problem. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, that that isn't inside baseball. That's the question of how big outlets do their job. And like, you know, one of my newsletters was about the epistemic break. I mentioned Covington. Another was you know, Vox purporting to investigate and explain what happened at the Times in a way where it wasn't journalism, it was activism, it was like anti-Barry activism, like this guy did not try to reach out to anyone on the other side of this conflict within the Times, and I, I know there are multiple people on the other side of it, even I, not particularly well connected. It's just these, these norms about how journalism is conducted matter a lot, and I, I want to keep that separate from the sort of online drama shit show that's raging 24-7, but... um. Yeah, so the epistemic breach and, and the sort of collapse of journalistic norms in some corners of progressive journalism, that's a big deal. It, it, it affects what stories you see and how they're covered and how major issues are, are approached. So as I said, the Harper's Letter was initially conceived by Thomas Chatterton Williams, who was recently on Rebel Wisdom talking about unlearning race in 2020. But the idea that we can't talk about certain things if we're not from that background is part, seems to be part of the, the problem. Well, absolutely. That's how you um, you preclude the possibility of dialogue. That's what the the, the idea that um, there's a, what Glenn Lowry calls, and what I, I'm very um, convinced is a real problem in today's discourse is this idea of identity epistemology. Um, that because I am black, I have access to some kind of knowledge that you can never possess. So the only thing that you can do is you can be quiet and listen and be an ally. Um, but the only way that you can, the only authentic allyship is silence. Th that's not, you, we all know that that can't possibly hold, that can't work. That's, that's, that's not how you build a multi-ethnic society that works. And you know, there's a backlash there, like we talked in the beginning of unforeseen consequences to short-term power grabs. Um, this is, Partially, I don't want to say it's the only reason, but this is partially how we did end up with someone like Trump resonating so widely. Um, we're creating a society where everybody has uh, an identity that gives them um, 
a, a knowledge and a morality. We're moving towards identity morality, identity ethics. So everybody can be proud of their identity and it gives them some special insight into the human condition, except for one group. And that one group is the, the group that's historically been in power and that is aware that it's demographically shrinking. And so what does that set up? That sets up um, a situation where that group is going to, some of members of that group are going to fight like hell to, to react in the worst possible ways to this new world that, that clearly singles them out and punishes them. So in the last piece, I used a few frames from Brett and Eric Weinstein talking about the collapse of sense-making, the collapse of the institutions. In this, I want to refer back to the Blue Church, which Jordan Hall talks about as the system that kind of arose after the Second World War and was really based on a kind of broadcast modality and how that was increasingly challenged by decentralized media. The Blue Church emerged in the context of having to figure out how to navigate all of these changes and generate coherence. How do we get all of these people with these new capacities to be able to make sense of the world in some fashion that is able to then make choices together and to act effectively? Right? That's the question. And the Blue Church developed to be the answer to that question. Right? So it developed the ability to say, for example, use the education system to establish an embodied sense of vertical meritocratic hierarchy. Right? The idea that some people are better at others in knowing certain kinds of things. We can find them and then we empower them to have hierarchical authority in the structure that we're in. There's a relationship between authority and receptor that has a broadcast modality. So the Blue Church is very broadcast across its entire mode. So what I mean by broadcast, of course, is exemplified in television, which is to say that, that some small number of people get to speak and a very, very large number of people get to listen. And so it's very different than, than say, uh, what we're doing right here. This is symmetric. While, of course, I'm the one speaking, in principle, there's nothing about this conversation that couldn't be perfectly symmetric. But in television, in any kind of broadcast modality, it's structurally that way. So Walter Cronkite tells the news, and everybody else watches it. And there's a lot of passivity there. Like, my job is not to um, perceive what's going on make sense of it, and then express it in the world. My job is to see the story that I'm being told and be able to then express that story effectively in the society that I'm in. There's very good reasons to believe that the Blue Church is done, meaning that it's in the senescence stage. And senescence has a characteristic where when you move into the senescence stage, you tend to go downhill pretty quickly. So I'm expecting to see the Blue Church sort of increasingly obviously failing and increasingly obviously losing the habitual or unconscious or unspoken um, position of being authoritative and being just reality. Right? More and more people are going to be going, ah, that's a thing. That's not the whole thing. It's a thing. And it's kind of doing something. And maybe parts of it are still good, but it's not the whole thing. And it seems to be increasingly fucked up. And in the meantime, looking around going, okay, now what? That's the key. Right? right now we're in a space. We're in that space between 1918 and 1945. We're in the space between 1077 BC and 800 BC, where there's a gap between a coherent collective intelligence, there's a coherent structure of being able to respond as a, as a whole to what's happening, and a new one, right? an old one, a new one, and, and they're fading. So we're witnessing that transition. We're in the middle of it. And a lot of the phenomenon that we've been experiencing over the past, what, 15 years or so, are of that sort, it's starting around 2000-ish. Um, particularly accelerating. You, know, you can explain a lot of the things that happened that seemed very inexplicable, like Brexit and Trump, using this model. So I think this is the most helpful frame to understand what's going on in journalism at the moment. We have an institution that was already increasingly fragile because the business model was being challenged by decentralized media. And so as the institutions get weaker, they're more vulnerable and able to be taken over. Do, do you think that it was sort of structural issues in journalism that have, that have kind of got it to the point where it's been taken over by this kind of situation? How, how would you frame it? It sort of feels a bit like a kind of mirror of the, of the whole pandemic to me, like a weak, a weak host being taken over via virus in double quick time. 
yeah, we've talked about this a little too, but some people, there's just like two simple catchphrases that particularly people on the right use like go woke, go broke as though people are, are these journalists, these outlets are struggling because of their political stances. But I think Katie and I both think the opposite is true is that the structural problems with journalism go so far beyond ideology. There's just an entire business model has collapsed. A business model that 30 years ago was such that, you know, the Baltimore Sun and the Boston Globe could have foreign bureaus, which is unthinkable now. I think as an institution collapses, the culture inside it is going to get very weird. And and in this case, what you see basically is that whatever concerns upper middle class graduates of elite universities is more and more what they care about. Uh, and that is where wokeness resides. So yeah, I think, I think obviously they feed back into one another because like maybe people will stop reading certain publications as they get less and less trustworthy, but overall I'm much more in the camp of um, go broke, go woke than vice versa. Yeah. The structural stuff is a, is a much bigger deal. And it's all, and this goes back decades. This goes back to Craigslist and then social media. I mean, the business models have, have totally collapsed. I mean, just for instance, like the Seattle times, the big sort of daily paper here 20 years ago had 5,000 staffers today. They have sold their buildings. They exist on two floors in a tiny building. It was apparently uh, the, the, the publisher was offered like $730 million in the early, early two thousands from, you know, Gannett or some like, major corporation to buy this paper and today it is almost worthless um so that i mean that's really the issue is that the industry is failing and the response the response to that has been for everybody to sort of go kind of crazy in some ways um but it is not i think yeah the the structural issues really precede sort of the um the other things that are happening within within this and i also think this is also part of a broader a broader trend in the culture a lot of which has to do with sort of backlash against donald trump and a lot of fear about um you know, him sort of ushering into uh, people think that he's going to usher in, you know, a new age of fascism or authoritarianism into into the into the nation. And so there's been this sort of uh, Ben Smith from The New York Times calls it re- resistance journalism. And I do think there has been a trend over the past couple of years for journalists to really sort of see themselves more or maybe they still see themselves as journalists, but they've really turned into activists. Um, and, you know, and everybody sort of wants to be on the right side of history. We're in such a weird moment in time that. People are deeply concerned about the country, understandably, and they want to sort of do the right thing, but do the right thing in this case often means sort of shaking off these, uh, the values of journalism that have existed for a long time. And obviously, Brett Weinstein has thought about this as much as anyone after what happened to him at Evergreen College. Uh, this is from a forthcoming piece that I've got with him. The connection between what's going on in the wider world and what took place at Evergreen is so close that it is unmistakable for anybody who saw the initial episode unfold as closely as we did. The reason that this is happening is that there is an epistemology that has existed for many years inside of the critical theory disciplines, and it evolved into a method. And that method got tested in the microcosm of college environments, especially Evergreen. So we experienced what it was like, we discovered the various tropes. And now what we are simply seeing is that, as one should have predicted, those who went to college and learned this perspective have now moved into positions in society, some of them in close proximity to power, and they have now begun to exert that influence in earnest. When we're saying that this is the evergreening of society, what was the outcome of evergreen? Because on one side, you could kind of look at it as like you... You've sort of uh, come out, you, you, you've started up your own podcast, you, you've actually kind of managed to land on your feet. So I think many people maybe think that Evergreen ultimately was a success story of pushing back against the radical left. Is that what happened? Yes and no. The important thing to realize is that there is a mapping of what happened at Evergreen, and it, it reflects various different outcomes. So there is what happened to Evergreen, there's what happened to Heather and to me, and then there is what happened to the movement inside. And if you track these things independently, and then you map them onto civilization, you'll understand where we're headed and why I'm so worried about it. So I did land on my feet, but one thing that is important for people who are considering their own jeopardy to realize is that there was not room in the outer world for an indefinitely large number of people to play my role. So that is to say, yes, a small number of people may make it out by 
maneuvering, maneuvering deftly through the traps and demonstrating that it is possible. There's a hunger to see that people can accomplish that goal. And while I wasn't able to preserve my job or Heather's job, I was able to carve out a niche in the outer world and I'm doing fine. I should say what Heather and I have lost is the security that our jobs provided. We have essentially none going forward. One bad tweet and things could turn around on us. But in terms of our quality of life, we uh, we are doing fine and did not, we suffered briefly, but then have recovered based on other things we were able to do that the world had some need for. But if you look at the institution, the institution has been utterly crippled by what happened. The movement took over with the aid of the president because the president partnered with the mob. The college was um, reduced to a laughing stock. The plans that were deployed were crippling to the college and the loss of reputation that came from obviously phony ideas becoming paramount at the school is one from which nobody thinks it will recover. So if we now map this onto society, we have a small number of us out here in society who are indeed able to make a living by talking about what's gone wrong and what to think about it. But you also have a movement that is advancing incredibly foolish policy proposals, and you have a power structure that is kowtowing to it. And what will be the result? It will be just like Evergreen. And increasingly, it seems that the only people who can actually speak freely are those outside the institutions. And I wanted to, to, to come to something we, we were talking about before, which is on one level, I mean, both of us, I think we watch this sort of thing happen and we've got this kind of deep visceral sense of we're losing these really powerful institutions or these institutions are kind of dissolving in front of our faces. But at the same time, we've both been able to make the leap into the independent media. Like in some ways, this is a kind of really weird business opportunity to, and to be able to kind of speak freely because we're outside the institutions. Um, and it feels like a really, like, how do you d personally deal with that? Because I guess you're watching all of this stuff, feeling energized by it, but also feeling, wow, I've got something new to talk about on the podcast and people are going to love it. So how do you balance those two things? Yeah, it's complicated. I mean, I, I'm really fortunate and I still have a foot in mainstream media and that, you know, I have a book coming out. Um, I was lucky to like be able to sign on with a big publisher. It'll be out in April. The Quick Fix, please buy it. Um, Quick Fix is the name. I, I'm torn on this in a lot of ways. I think Katie and I would both rather have it be the case that journalism is healthy and thriving and people aren't going to throw money at two assholes on a podcast talking about internet nonsense. But uh, because mainstream media is increasingly unable to have normal conversations being had by people all over the the country will will jump in we'll seize that opportunity and we've been so gratified at the success so far and genuinely shocked at how quickly this has become this now supports us more than supports us um people should maybe take some lessons from that maybe the the outlets like the times and other main mainstream outlets that would never ever host a podcast like this should should perhaps consider the money and the viewers they're leaving on the table the most likely outcome is that journalism is going to continue to collapse and the next round of funding or whatever will, I think, be toward efforts more like ours. I would rather a thousand pro publica sprout. I'd rather have there be investigative journal. I mean, if there's like a, if the Columbus, Ohio police department has a major scandal, who the hell is going to cover that? That's much more important than what Katie and I do. And, and that's what I'm worried about is that you know, let's say a year from now, there's 10 blocked and reported 20 more people can make a living doing that kind of commentary and, and making fun of the demise of progressive journalism while being progressive themselves. I, I just, that's not as important as actual journalism and reporting. So in that sense, like whatever qualms I have with the times, they still do really good investigative stuff. They still have some of the most talented reporters in the country. Same with the Washington Post, same with other outlets where I increasingly can't read their culture coverage because it's just I can't. I, I'll read the Wesleyan student paper if I want those takes. Um, so I, I don't want these outlets to collapse. I want, in a sense, I want them to thrive. I mean, uh, just fun journalism. Um, it's a weird situation. Uh, and I, I don't want my entire life to be covering and talking about this stuff because it's exhausting. And 
Yeah, I'm lucky. I, the book I, I have coming out is not about this stuff. It's about weightier issues. So um, it's such a weird time. And, and two months ago, I was just disconsolate about the state of journalism. I still am, but now I feel like I have a life raft and I feel there's a little bit of survivor's guilt that other people don't have that life raft. Thanks for watching and see you soon. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon.